Hello everyone. Today we'll be looking at the most popular programming languages of the 1960s and solving a leak code problem in all of them. Most of these languages have changed so much since the 60s, so the way I'm using them obviously won't be the same as they were used back then. For example, I couldn't find a way to compile and or run an Algol 50 program, so I'll have to settle for Algol 60, a later standard of the language. For the most part, I made some effort to use an older version of each language to get a better feel for what it would be like to use the language back in the day. And along with my solution for each language, I'll give a little bit of history and a quote from Edsger Dijkstra. His scathing remarks about pretty much every single language on this list were too good to leave out. So here's our problem. The problem is to find the peak element, uh, one that is greater than both the neighbors on the left and the right. So here's the problem description. You can pause and look at it for longer if you want. We won't be dwelling on it for too long. Here's one of the examples we'll be using. You can see that three is the peak element because it's greater than both the elements, the left and the right. And here's another example. We'll just breeze right along. And here they are ranked. We'll be starting at the bottom with APL and working our way all the way up to Fortran. So we'll start with a quick timeline. APL was originally designed by Ken Iverson in 1957 as a mathematical notation to be used on blackboards. Ken Iverson was then hired by IBM in 1960 to further develop the notation. At that point, still just mathematical notation and not yet a programming language. Ken Iverson's paper, A Programming Language, was published in 1962 and would be the basis for naming the language APL. Finally, in 1966, IBM released APL 360, written in a bit under 40,000 lines of basic assembly language 360. Just before leaving IBM, in 1979, Iverson gave his famous ACM Turing Award lecture titled Notation as a Tool of Thought, where he builds up algorithm intuition in the reader using the APL language. In 1980, Iverson left IBM for IP Sharp Associates, where he developed Sharp APL. It was just after this, in 1981, that Dialog APL was born, potentially the most popular implementation to this day, and a significant force in the APL community. Ken Iverson moved on from IP Sharp in 1990 to J Software to write the J programming language along with Roger Hui, a colleague from IP Sharp who sadly passed away earlier this month in October 2021. There's so much more to the history of APL, but this is all the detail that I'll be going into in this video. So now let's get right into our APL solution. Here's our Dijkstra quote. APL is a mistake carried through to perfection. It's the language of the future for the programming techniques of the past. It creates a new generation of coding bums. <laughs> Gotta love it. So these solutions were given to me by Adam Brzezinski on the Apple Farm Discord server. Please forgive my pronunciation of your name there. This runs on APL 360 thanks to an IBM 5110 emulator. How cool is that? I used this IBM 360 user's manual to play around with Adam's solutions in the emulator. And here is our actual solution. Honestly, this looks and feels just about as expressive as modern APLs. Adam also gave two other APL 360 solutions, but I'll just leave those on the blog post. You can go check it out if you want to. I also solved this in BQN just for fun, but that wasn't the point of this video, so I won't spend too much time on this either. So that's our APL solution. So now moving on to our next language, we'll be looking at Lisp. This Dijkstra quote is a little bit longer, so I won't read the full thing, but I will leave it here for you to enjoy it. So Lisp was invented by John McCarthy in 1958 at MIT with his paper, Recursive Functions of Symbolic Expressions and Their Computation by Machine, Part 1, which is a fantastic title. This seemed to parallel Ken Iverson's paper A Programming Language in that this paper led to Scheme while Iverson's paper led to APL. Part two of that paper was never written, by the way. I used MIT Scheme for my Lisp since it seems like the oldest Lisp implementation that I can still install. Although Scheme is such an old language, it felt very futuristic and clean. I've used other Lisps before, but I'm nowhere near an expert. Scheme felt like a wonderful and comprehensible tool. I really loved using it, and I think I'll be spending some more quality time with Scheme in these videos. And if you have a better solution, please let me know. I'd love to see it. Note that I found the built-in functions for Scheme a bit lacking. For example, I had to write my own functions to shift a value into a list. And here's what it looks like to use them. Although I had to write my own, it did come pretty easily. Let's walk through our full solution inside out. So for an input 1231, we'll find the max of shifting left and right. If a number is greater than the max value of the left and right, we'll know it's greater than both the left and the right value. 
Now we just have to find the indices in the input where the input is greater than the last return value, the greater of either shift. Then we can just take the index if the previous map give us true or negative one otherwise. And then we take the max of these values to find the peak element. Here's the same code as before. We've just wrapped it in a max reduce to get our final answer. Of course, now we can just wrap all that code up in a function. And then we run it on a few inputs to verify our solution. And that's our Lisp solution. Now on to our next language at number four on the list, we have basic. You note that this is the logo for free basic, which was the implementation that I used. And again, a scathing Dijkstra quote, it's impossible to teach good programming to students that have had prior exposure to basic. Um, some pretty harsh language here. And this is the solution that I came up with. So BASIC stands for Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. BASIC was designed by two math professors at Dartmouth College in 1964. John Kemney, one of the co-creators of BASIC, attended lectures from John von Neumann and worked as Albert Einstein's mathematical assistant for a time. And Tom Kurtz, the other co-creator, first proposed the concept of time sharing. So these guys were clearly pretty bright. BASIC was probably the first beginner-oriented language with the goal of getting students started writing programs as quickly as possible without having to take a course on programming. Although it was a programming on-ramp for me, I still have to side with Dijkstra a little bit on BASIC, although maybe not so harshly. BASIC was the product of some pretty brilliant folks and it had a huge impact on the history of programming, but I can't say I recommend it today. The solution is pretty much the same solution I use for the rest of the programming languages. I create a wrapper array so I can pretend that out of balance in either direction is negative infinity. I then check all the values to see if any element is greater than the elements to its left and its right. And as much as I tried, I couldn't find a way to initialize arrays in basic, so I had to assign to every element. If someone has more experience with basic, please let me know how you would solve this. And now that we're done with basic, we are on to our next language, which is Algol. And you may notice that Algol is the only language that does not have a scathing quote from Dijkstra. This is probably in part because Dijkstra was a significant contributor to Algol, which we'll get into later. I'm using the Algol 68 Genie compiler interpreter for this code. I honestly found Algol pretty usable. I saw some code that used function pointers and it looked pretty clean too. It seems like Algol has some pretty modern first class function capabilities and I can see why it was the language in which computer algorithms were published for many years. Algol was actually designed by an international committee of the ACM during 1958-60 to 60 for this purpose. Dijkstra was heavily involved in these meetings, but ironically his name doesn't appear on the list of 13 authors in the final report. And this is because he left the committee prematurely because he could not agree with the majority opinions, which is really hard to believe. And that's all for the Algol solution. I honestly wouldn't mind writing some more Algol down the line. So on to our next programming language, we have COBOL. And of course, an absolutely scathing Dijkstra quote, the use of COBOL cripples the mind. Its teaching should therefore be regarded as a criminal offense. Gotta love it. So the history behind COBOL is extremely inspiring and exciting. However, COBOL was pretty painful to use. And I only learned the most shallow bit of COBOL. In order to read more like plain English, COBOL has over 300 keywords. I can only imagine what it feels like to maintain a 500,000 line COBOL code base. And I use the GNU COBOL compiler for this example. You'll notice that everything is indented. COBOL, like several of the other languages I'm covering here, was originally used on a punch card. Each punch card represented a single line of code, and the first six and final eight columns of each card were reserved for sequence numbers and identifiers, which you'll see here as an asterisk for comments and a dash for line continuation. Now this here is the full code that it took me to solve this really simple problem. I can only imagine how much code it would take to solve a more complex problem. I certainly felt the effects of COBOL's history as a language written on punch cards when I tried to write this function. Every time I had to change a condition that wrapped a line, I would join the lines together and figure out where the new line break should be and make sure to get the dash character in the seventh column. I'm sure there are some more modern conventions around COBOL considering a whopping 5 billion lines of new COBOL code are written every single year, but I'm pretty content not to write any COBOL for a while. Now on to the inspiring stuff. In summary, COBOL was designed by a consensus-driven committee with a huge focus on portability led by women. In 1959, Grace Hopper, a retired Navy officer, organized a meeting of users and manufacturers to conceive of a programming language in response to Mary Haw's call 
for a portable programming language that could be compiled and ran on computers from multiple manufacturers. You can read more about the history of COBOL on this Twitter thread from Bryce Lelbach, which you should definitely check out. I think we have a lot to learn from COBOL and a lot to be thankful for. The ISO didn't even come along until 1988, long after Grace Hopper initiated the Committee for the Development of COBOL. I'm sure we owe a huge debt to COBOL and the women-led, consensus-driven community that gave it to us. I want to learn all that I can from that history, but I don't want to write any more COBOL than I have to. So now that we're done with COBOL, we are on to our final language. Fortran, the grand finale, number one on our list. I completely disagree with Dijkstra on this quote. I absolutely love Fortran's history, and I occasionally write it professionally. So in 1953, John Backus, who I've pictured here, submitted a proposal to his bosses at IBM to develop a more practical alternative to assembly language. The first compiler didn't come around until 1957. The name Fortran is derived from formula translation and very quickly became the lingua franca for scientific computing. Fortran is still one of the most used programming languages in high performance computing, and it's not going away anytime soon. The Flang project, part of the LLVM project, is a more modern Fortran compiler targeting the 2018 standard with support for OpenAC, OpenMP, and other cool optimization stuff. It's written in wonderfully modern and well-maintained C++, and I use the C++ style guide from Flang for my technical teams at my day job. Flang is definitely worth keeping an eye on, and I think it will become a significant force in high-performance computing in the coming years. So I tried using the G77 compiler from GCC 3.4 for this example to get a better feel for historical Fortran. But after removing some syntax I didn't realize came along with F90, I realized that the 32-bit build of GCC that I had would probably not be able to target my modern machine. This at least let me know that my code was valid for Fortran 77, and after removing any compilation errors with G77, I just built the example with G Fortran from GCC 11 up to. And here's the example. There were a couple things that I really, really missed from Fortran 90 and beyond, but honestly, this example is still pretty readable. In Fortran 90, I'm used to doing block array assignments like this, which I really, really like, instead of something more verbose like this. And I didn't get to use the intent keyword, both of which were huge drawbacks, but this really wasn't too bad. Looking to the future of Fortran, GCC's G Fortran is very actively maintained. The newest NVIDIA HPC SDK has fantastic Fortran support. The new U.S. Department of Energy Exascale Computer Frontier will use AMD GPUs, which have HIPFORT, a Fortran interface to AMD GPU libraries, and that will be the most powerful computer on the planet when it comes out. Intel's GPU platform and Fortran compiler are widely used as well. Fortran has a wonderfully rich history, and it's certainly part of our future. Okay, we've now looked at all of the top languages from the 1960s. I hope you all enjoyed this foray into the history of programming languages and computing in general. I'll leave some more information in the description and on the blog post if you're curious. Thanks for watching.